Hello everyone. Welcome to the Granite Bay Hilltop Church Sabbath School Study Hour. I don't know about you, but I am so excited to get into today's topic as we continue to look at the book of Psalms. And uh, we are looking at lesson number four today, and it is titled, The Lord Hears and Delivers. But before we get into that, I want to point you to our free offering that goes along with our study. It is titled, No Turning Back. This is a, a Bible study guide, and you can get that by dialing the number 866-788. 3966 and asking for offer number 146. If you're in the United States of America, you can also text to the number 40544, the, the number SH137. And if you're outside of the United States, you can go to study.aftv.org forward slash SH137 and you can get a free download of No Turning Back. Well, before we get into our study this morning, let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh, loving Father, we are so grateful and thankful that you love us, that you have such a great plan for us, and that, Lord, uh, you are working and Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on this place and uh, all of those that are watching uh, would have the Holy Spirit guiding and directing, that your angels would be with us, ministering to us. And Lord, in the end, we would not only have more knowledge, but Lord, we would be able to apply your word to our lives and allow you to do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. And we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, family, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or you're watching at home online in the local area across the country or around the world, I am excited to be able to present to you the things that the Lord has put on my heart in regards to the book of Psalms. And I just thought that I would start with uh, some information that I think is uh, interesting and uh, maybe even some amazing facts. Like, did you know that the book of Psalms is the largest book in the Bible and it explores a full range of human experience in everything from the personal uh, to the practical and uh, the breadth of our subject matter in the book of Psalms, which, by the way, means songs, includes diverse topics such as uh, jubilation, war, peace, uh, worship, judgment. There's messianic prophecies in the Psalms, praise and lament. And the Psalms interestingly enough, were set to the accompaniment of stringed instruments and they served, the book of Psalms actually served as the temple hymn book and a devotional guide for the Jewish people. The book of Psalms is a compilation of writings that came in from various places and they were gradually collected and originally it was an unnamed book, perhaps due to the great variety of material that it uh, encompassed. It came to be known as the book of praises because almost every psalm has a praise to God. The Septuagint, which is the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, calls it poems sung to the accompaniment of musical instruments. And the central theme of the book of Psalms is worship. And so God is worthy of all praise. Why? Because of who He is. 
God is all-knowing. God is infinite. And God is in the past. And he is in the present. And he is in the future. So we praise God because of who he is. We praise God for what he has done. And we praise God because his goodness extends through all time and eternity. The Psalms present personal responses to God as they reflect on his plan of salvation. God has a program. God has a plan for his people. And we should have a keen desire to see his plan of salvation fulfilled and to praise his name. Many of the Psalms survey the word of God and the attributes of God, especially during difficult times. And the kind of faith that produces confidence in his power in spite of our circumstances. And today we are going to focus on the fact that God hears and God delivers. And I find it very interesting that there are several psalms, many of them, that start with a cry by the psalmist for God to listen. I want you to notice Psalm 4 verse 1 says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. I want you to notice that this this psalmist recognizes that they need a higher power. They need someone who can help in their time of need. And they recognize that they have no righteousness of their own. Listen when I call. Hear me when I call. Oh God, you are righteous. Psalm 13 verse 3 says, Consider and hear me. O Lord my God. Psalm 17 verse 1 says, Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Notice that this psalmist is saying, Lord, I'm not coming to you with the trivial. I'm not coming with you with a, a, a small slimmer of hope. But, but I have a just cause. I have a great need. And Lord, please attend to my cry. Psalm 28 verse 2 says, Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you. Psalm 54 verse 2 says, Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. In, in such songs, the, the psalmist is, is crying out to God. And, and many times with a heart filled with grief. A, a, a heart filled with anxiety, a, a heart that is, is desperate for someone to come alongside and deliver someone to provide the way forward. I want you to notice Psalm 55, verse 1 and 2. It says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and do not hide yourself from my supplication. Attend to me and hear me. I am restless in my complaint and moan noisily. You, you can feel the heart of the psalmist as they're reaching out to God. I'm, I'm desperate for you, Lord. Psalm 61 verse 1 and 2 says, Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. I love how the, the psalmist in, includes in, in this, this cry to the Lord, I will search to the ends of the earth for you. I will cry out to the farthest places and, and, and try to reach out to you. My, my heart is, is overwhelmed and I need a foundation. I need the solid rock upon whom I can stand. 
Brothers and sisters, do you hear the sense of urgency and the great need in the voice of the psalmist? Psalm 102, verse 1 and 2, continues that theme of, of Lord, hear my prayers and, and let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my trouble. Incline your ear to me in the day that I call. Answer me speedily, Lord. Oh, Lord, I need you and I need you now. Oh, family, we all desire that God would hear us and that he would respond, don't we? I remember years ago, my grandson, uh, he's a full-grown adult now, has his own family, but when he was just a little boy, they came to visit, and we were uh, out in the yard, and, and he was running around and, and playing and, and having a good time, and, and I was... Uh, doing some stuff and and he comes up to me and he he looks up to me and he says grandpa I need you oh you can imagine how my heart just melted and I and I wanted to to just give to him anything that I could and I I looked down at him and I said well well what do you need and, you know, you could see him kind of looking off a little bit and wondering. And he, and he says, I'm thirsty. And I said, okay, then let's go into the house and let's get a drink of water. And so we, we went in and he got a drink. And then we, we came back outside and he started running around and playing. And, and uh, maybe a half an hour uh, or so later, he comes up to me and he says, Grandpa, I need you. And I said, oh, my precious boy, what can I do? What, what, what do you need? And he said, I'm hungry. And so I said, okay, well, let's go in the house and, and see what we can find. And I, I just imagine that in the book of Psalms, we see all of these people that are just crying out to God. And I just imagine that God's heart is touched, just like mine was for my grandson. I imagine my father having the same response to me, a, a, a desire to just give me those things that I need. And when we are in need, and when we are in trouble, and when we are hurting, we want to know that God hears us, don't we? Many times in the prayers of the saints, I, I, I find it very interesting that, that as you look at these psalms, you see that, that these psalmists, they weren't you know, kind of uh, uh, hopeful. They, they weren't just kind of, uh, well, I hope that God hears me. Many times they, they were forceful. They were insistent that God would pay attention. Notice in Psalm 30, verse 10, the psalmist says, Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. There's, a, there's a, a forcefulness. There's an insistence there. God, I need your help. Psalm 69, verse 13 says, O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink and let me be delivered from those who hate me. Oh, I don't know about you, but I find this uh, psalm to be incredibly uh, precious to me because I want you to notice he says, Lord, in the acceptable time. I know uh, as a pastor, uh, many times you ask for prayer requests. And, and, and many times it's, it's a very personal level. Uh, a person is, is having some need of their own, whether it's physical or, or uh, financial or, or whatever it may be. Uh, maybe they have a, a family member who has an, an, an illness or a disease and, and you know how it is. Uh, we just want to pray everything away, don't we? Just, Lord, take it all away. 
And you know, I, I'm happy to pray for people, especially in, in when they're hurting and when they're struggling. But many times I've just wondered in my mind if as I'm praying, uh, I imagine God saying, no, I got them right where I want them. You know, sometimes God allows uh, difficulties and challenges of life to come in because he's trying to get our attention. Now, sometimes God is trying to, to pull us back. I remember a, a couple of months ago, uh, I was complaining to my wife. And, oh, she's, she's so precious to me. She, she's very straightforward with me. She doesn't hold anything back. And as I'm complaining and I'm saying to her, why does this keep happening? And she's just, matter of fact, straight out says to me, well, maybe God's trying to teach you something and you're not getting it. And, you know, that's a kind of eye-opening experience. And it's like, well, I wonder what that might be. And then that changes the way we pray. But, but this psalmist recognizes that God's timing is not always our timing. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, family, but God is always on time. He's never early and he's never late, but sometimes we sure wish that he would go faster. But this psalmist recognizes the providence of God. He recognizes that God's in charge and he says, in the acceptable time, Lord, when the timing is right, in the multitude of your mercy, in, in your compassion, Lord, save me. Uh, pull me out of the mire. Let me not sink. And uh, so uh, I, I find it uh, awesome that this this psalmist recognizes that God's timing is not always there and you know sometimes we just need to pray Lord uh, when the acceptable time is then do this but in the meantime give me peace give me patience Lord, help me to hold on to you. Don't let me lose my faith when things are, are going bad. But help me to hold on to you. And Lord, when you see fit, bring healing. Bring uh, uh, salvation. Bring what it is that we need. And isn't it great that we can affirm that God has heard our complaints and our needs. In Psalm 22, verse 24, this is one of those messianic psalms. It says, For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from me. But when I cried to him, he heard. I love that. When I cried to him, he heard. Notice Psalm 66, verse 19. But certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. And in Psalm 120, verse 1, it says, In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips. Brothers and sisters, I have a question for you. And that question is this. How did the psalmist know that God had heard them? I imagine that there's only one way. And that is that the psalmist knew that God had heard because he was delivered. Because he, he was brought forth from the, from the snare of the fowler, from the hands of his enemy. Because the heart cry was answered and the relief from the difficulty had come forth. You know, friends... Remembering how God has answered prayers in the past 
strengthens the psalmist to be able to say, and he heard me. The answer hasn't come yet, but I know that he heard me because he's heard me in the past and he's delivered me in the past and he's provided for me in the past. And so I can have confidence today that he hears me and I know that in the future that he will hear me. And the psalmist is is building up in faith. I want you to notice Psalm 18, verse 1 and 2. It says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. This psalmist has a great trust that God is going to hear and that God is going to respond and that there's going to be an outcome to this situation. In Psalm 6, verse 8 through 10, it says, For the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping, The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. I love the fact that this psalmist assures us that God hears our prayers. And you know, there are some of the psalms that that show us that God hears in the morning, that God hears at noon, and that God hears in the nighttime. In other words, the psalmist are assuring us that God never sleeps or slumbers, but God is always attentive to our needs. I want you to notice Psalm 5, verse 3. It says, My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you, and I will look up. You know, you look at the the book of Daniel, and you see that Daniel prayed every morning and every noon and every evening. And uh, uh, the the idea there was that it was a, a, a continual of prayer throughout the day. In Psalm 55, verse 17, it says, Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Oh, praise God that he hears our prayers. Even in the midst of everything that's going on in the world, God is attentive to your personal needs. I love how in Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, it says, Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you, says the Lord. If you have your study for this week, in your quarterly, and you, you have it open till Sunday. I, I love what it says here in that first paragraph. It says, did you ever want to help someone but had no means? Likewise, some people tried to help you but did not understand your needs. Unlike even the most loving and best-intentioned people, God has both the perfect knowledge of us and of our circumstances and also the means to help us. Therefore, His promises of help and deliverance are not shallow platitudes, but firm assurances. And the psalmist says, uh, a mother may forget her child, a a family may uh, fail you, But God never will. Your family might forget. Your family may not hear you. But God hears you. God will hear our cry. I'd like you to turn with me for a moment in your Bibles 
to Psalm 106. There are 150 psalms, and we're going to go to 106. And I want you to notice here what it says. Verse 44, Nevertheless, he regarded their affliction when he heard their cry. Then verse 45, And for their sake he remembered his covenant. I want you to notice there in, in verse 45, it says God heard their cry. That word here, there, means to perceive the voice or, or to register the sound. That's the, the simplest part of the definition. But to hear means more than just registering the sound. It means that he listened and he acted upon what he had heard. In other words, we can trust God that he is going to act on our behalf in response to our prayers. Oh, brothers and sisters, I hope that that brings comfort to your soul, especially in those times when we are hurting, in those times when we are troubled, in those times when, when it seems like the whole world is crashing down around us. We can have confidence, we can trust that God not only hears the sound, but he acts upon our prayers. Notice in Exodus chapter 2, verse 24, it said, So God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. When Israel was enslaved in Egypt, the Lord heard their cry. And he delivered them. And so the book of Psalms is an invitation to us to have that same level of confidence that God will deliver us from our trials. You know, in the book of Psalms, God is depicted as a powerful king. And that he is ready to fight for his people. And at the same time, he is also represented as kind and loving and caring for those who believe in him. Uh, brothers and sisters, there are a lot of different religions in the world. And there are a lot of different what people call gods. But is there a God? like our God? Is there a God that would pay a penalty for us? Is there a God who, who hears our cry and, and, and responds and provides and, and moves obstacles out of our way? You know, there are various images in the book of Psalms of God's tender loving care. God is depicted in Psalm 23 as a, a, a loving shepherd who is taking care of his defenseless sheep. And as our shepherd, we see in Psalm 23 that God provides for all of our needs. For God provides the rest. God provides food. God provides water. God provides comfort. God provides guidance. God provides his very presence and an abundance and mercy there in Psalm 23. In Psalm 91, the, the psalmist gives us this, this picture of a, of a mother bird who is covering her chicks with her wings, providing a, a, a refuge, providing a, a place of security. And God is compared to, to that sort of an analogy of 
of God uh, providing and protecting and watching over his children. In Psalm 121, we see God as our keeper. We see him being ever attentive to and, and alert to our needs. In Psalm 103, we see God as a father who pities his children, who is the protector of the fatherless. And yet God's love and protection transcends any kind of pity and protection that a parent can provide for their children. God transcends all of the bonds of love. I want you to notice in Psalm 27, verse 10, it says, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. What a tender description of God's kindness on behalf of every one of us. May such pictures inspire us to lean fully on God and trust in His care. I, I love that verse that says to lean on God and not on our own understanding, but to trust Him that He has a plan. God says, I know the plans I have for you. They are for good and not for evil. And family, we can take that to the bank. We can trust that God has our best interest at heart. But you know, the psalmists also reveal God as being our shelter. Notice in Psalm 143, verse 9, it says, Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. You can, you can imagine the word pictures there uh, uh, of how uh, God is our shelter. He is our protection. He is our provider. He is our defender. In Psalms, we also see that God is a strong tower. Now, in biblical times, a, a, a strong tower probably had far more meaning to them than it does to us today. Uh, but we can use words like safeguard and provider and protector to mean the same thing. I want you to notice Psalm 61 verse 3. It says, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. Brothers and sisters, when the whole world is crashing down around you, you have a shelter that you can run to and, and, and get that protection that you need. And you know, we also see in the Psalms that God is our strength. Notice in Psalm 18 verse 1, it says, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And in the Psalms, God is referred to as a fortress. In the next verse, Psalm 18 verse 2, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. Oh, family, there's a lot of stuff there in that. The Lord is my rock. Jesus is the rock of our salvation. In Daniel chapter 2, he is described as the stone that was cut out without hands. He's described in the, in the Gospels as the chief cornerstone. But Jesus is the rock that we can run to. Uh, I can't help but think about the, the parable that Jesus told of the, of the wise man who built upon the rock. We need to build our lives and, 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 and put the foundation of our faith in the rock 
of Jesus. And it says that he is a fortress. He is someone that I can come to for protection. There's someone that I can reach out to that can give me that peace that the world can't give. The, the joy uh, of God. And he is my deliverer. You know, as I was preparing for this lesson, I, I couldn't help but think of, of, of some of the times that, that I was crying out to God to be my deliverer. And some of those times, there were things that were going on that were beyond my control. But then there were other things that it was my fault that I was in this predicament. And now I'm, I'm crying out to God. But as a loving parent, I can trust. I love that words in the, in the last part of that sentence, in whom I will trust. I can trust God because he is my God. And he will provide the strength that I need to get through this. Uh, oh, oh, friends, did you ever notice that God never promises to take away the problems? He only promises to be with us. And that he promises that he, if we lean on him, if we trust in him, he can provide us with the strength that we need to endure. As I was talking about earlier where, you know, sometimes uh, God might, might have us in this difficulty uh, to, to push us. I've, I've seen times in my own life where God shuts this door and shuts that door and this door and, and you're, you're wondering what is going on? Why are the, all the doors closing? It's so that he can maneuver you to the place where he wants to open a door and he is my strength until I get there. In Acts chapter 4 verse 11 it says Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected. Oh, friend, don't reject Jesus, but accept him into your heart. Ask him to come in to be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins and build your life upon him. I want you to notice in continuing this theme of the rock, in Psalm 28, verse 1, it says, To you I will cry, O Lord, my rock. In Psalm 31, verse 2, it says, Bow down your ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge. And in Psalm 62, verse 2, it says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Oh, family, I don't know about you, but in these last days, it has been a major part of my personal prayers. Lord, I want to be so settled into the truth that I can't be moved. And I love how uh, this psalmist is saying, I shall not be moved. I will trust no matter what's happening all around me. Uh, I, I love that passage. Uh, a thousand may fall at your left hand and 10,000 at your right, but this pestilence will not come near you. And then we also see in the book of Psalms that God is our shield. I want you to notice Psalm 28 verse 7. It says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. We need a shield today, don't we, from all of, the, all of the stuff that's trying to come in from all of the various places all around us. And we need a shield to protect us from, from that stuff coming in too and, and getting a stronghold in our lives. And you know, speaking of a stronghold, uh, God is referred to as a stronghold in the Psalms as well. Uh, back to Psalm 18, verse 2 that we looked at earlier. It says, God is the shield and horn of my salvation and my stronghold. Now, I, I want you to imagine all of these images uh, of ancient Israel that we've looked at with a stronghold and a, and a strong tower. Uh, we, we don't use those words so much 
anymore today. And so we really need to put these kinds of things into our, our own vernacular. And uh, I, I wonder what if we uh, uh, looked at these and, and, and we applied different words to them. We could say, God is my supervision. God is my guardian. God is my provider. We might use words today like God is my vindicator. God is my advocate. God is my champion. Uh, when I hear that word champion, I'm reminded uh, uh, how uh, scriptures tell us that, that Goliath was the champion of the Philistines. But family, we have a champion of our own. Jesus is our champion. And, and these, this imagery of, of vindicator and advocate and champion, this, this imagery is obviously uh, comes from the legal realm and is primarily employed in the context of scripture of a of a God watching over the fatherless and the widows and the psalms reveal that God is described as a father of the fatherless a defender of widows it tells us that in psalm 68 verse 5 in Psalm 76, verse 8 and 9, we see that it says, You caused judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared, and it was still. When God arose to judgment to deliver all the oppressed of the earth. I want you to notice back in Psalm 68, verse 5, when it says that God is the father of the fatherless and defender of the widows, I want you to notice that word defender that is translated into English, uh, defender, the, the original uh, Hebrew text, it, that word is the word dayan, which also can mean that God is a judge. And so God is the judge of the fatherless. God is the judge of the widow. God is our judge and there is a judgment. And the psalmist says, when you caused judgment to be heard, the earth feared. And we know, don't we, that there is a judgment that is going on in heaven right now. And so God always defends the oppressed. Psalm 72 verse 4 says, He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and he will break in pieces the oppressor. Psalm 103 verse 6 says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Family, have you noticed that many of the terms, the symbols, the metaphors that are used there in the Psalms have been shown uh, essentially that God watches and cares for us. In other words, it reveals that God is our deliverer. In the Psalms, there are at least four passages that reveal to us that God is our deliverer. I want you to notice in Psalm 18, verse 2, that it names God as our deliverer in the context of the psalmist struggling with his enemies. And in fact, in Psalm 18, uh, God is revealed as sovereign and as a mighty warrior. The second place is in Psalm 40, verse 1. It talks about deliverance from sin. And in this psalm, David acknowledges the crushing reality that the innumerable evils have surrounded him and that his iniquities have overtaken him. 
Uh, the, David had the same experience that I've had. Sometimes I get myself in trouble. And David recognizes in this psalm that it was his fault. His iniquities have overtaken him. But God is sovereign. God is in control. And God can deliver me from even my own mistakes. The third place we see in the psalm, God as a deliverer, is in Psalm 70, verse 5. And the psalmist calls on his deliverer to rescue him from the one who seeks his life and desires to do him harm. And then the fourth is in Psalm 144. The psalmist asks his deliverer to rescue him from the one whose mouth speaks lying words and whose right hand is a right hand of falsehood. Well, that's pretty obvious who the psalmist is asking God to deliver them from, from the evil one, from Satan himself. And as the Psalms show us God wants to deliver us from our sins. God wants to deliver us from our anxieties. God wants to deliver us from our problems, the trials, the challenges of life. And thus, in the fullest sense of the word, it depicts God, especially as Jesus as our Savior. And so the purpose of our study this week is not simply to admire the literary talent and the artistry of the psalmist. More than pleasure, such skillful imagery provides deep insight into the work of God in the redemption of of humanity. I want you to notice what David says in Psalm 3 verse 4. He says, I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard from his holy hill. In Psalm 18 verse 6 it says, in my distress I called upon the name of the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from his temple. Notice the language there. It says he heard from his holy hill. It says he heard my voice from his temple. In other words, God heard from the sanctuary in heaven. In Psalm 18, yeah, 18 verse 6, that word temple there meaning sanctuary. From this, we should be able to make a logical conclusion that God's tender watch care over us and His work of deliverance on our behalf begins with His work in the sanctuary in heaven. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not enough that Jesus died and paid our penalty for us. But he had to rise from the dead to show us that he has the power to not only raise himself up, but to raise us up as well. And it's not enough, but Jesus had to go back up into heaven and he had to become our high priest in the sanctuary. And his saving grace and his loving kindness is there for all of those who are called according to his purpose. All of those who call upon him as he ever lives to intercede on our behalf. You know, there are several key verses in the Psalms that teach us that the Lord works on our behalf from his heavenly sanctuary. Notice Psalm 20, verse 1 and 2. It says, May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help. From where? From the sanctuary. Notice Psalm 29, verse 9. It says, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. 
and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, that is in his sanctuary in heaven, everyone says, to God be the glory. Amen. I want you to notice Psalm 33, verse 13. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all of the sons of men. God sees everything. There's nowhere that we can go, uh, that we can get away from God. God sees and hears it all. Psalm 95, verse 5 and 6 says, For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before Him. Strength and beauty are in His sanctuary. Elias Brazil de Souza serves as the director of the Biblical Research Institute at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventist World Headquarters. And when he was working on his Ph.D., at Andrews University in 2005, he wrote uh, his dissertation and he titled it The Heavenly Sanctuary Temple Motif in the Hebrew Bible and then it had a subtitle of Function and Relationship to the Earthly Counterparts. And I want you to notice what he says in that dissertation. He says the heavenly sanctuary is also depicted as a place of worship where heavenly beings adore Yahweh. He is our source of help, and it is a place of atonement where cleansing and forgiveness are granted. In other words, God is our defender. God is our deliverer. And God hears from the sanctuary in heaven, and He is working on our behalf. You know, family, for the most part, as Seventh-day Adventists, we hear the expression heavenly sanctuary, and probably most of us immediately think of the Day of Atonement and the pre-Advent judgment that is going on in heaven right now at this very moment. And this for us today is present truth. But at the same time, when we think about the heavenly sanctuary, we need to focus on the work of forgiveness that is going on there right now. The work of, of defense that is going on there right now. The care that God has for us right now in His sanctuary. The protection that our Lord offers us from the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so Christ's work of priestly intercession on our behalf is essential. And all of heaven is involved in the redemption of man. The book of Psalms is a book of strong emotions that run the full range from ecstatic to lamenting, from complex to simple. But Psalms is also a book of deep theological concepts. The Bible truths studied in our lesson this week are rich with imagery and the wonderful promises that we can, that we can claim in our daily struggles. And family, I want to encourage you, as we are studying the book of Psalms this quarter, don't just go through uh, the verses that are listed there, but I want to encourage you to read through the entire book of Psalms as we are doing this study. I want to encourage you to seek out and to search those truths that are there. What kind of truths? Well, the truth that God hears from heaven. The truth that God cares about you and is aware of everything 
that you are going through. The truth that God is our shelter, our tower, our strength, our rock, our fortress, our shield, and our stronghold. The truth that God is our defender. That's what we looked at this week, right? God hears and God is our deliverer. And then the that God, in fact, is our deliverer. And then, of course, his help comes from the work that he is doing on our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. Amazing truths that God loves us. He hears from heaven and he responds. God is our deliverer. Well, friends, I hope that you were uh, blessed by our study uh, we are out of time, but before I close, I want to remind you of the free offer titled No Turning Back. This is an Amazing Facts Bible study, and you can get that by calling number 866-788-3966. If you're inside the United States, you can also get it by texting to the number 40544, the code sh 137. And if you're outside of the United States, you can go on the internet to uh, study.aftv.org forward slash sh137. God bless you all. Don't forget to request today's life changing free resource. Not only can you receive this free gift in the mail, you can download a digital copy straight to your computer or mobile device. To get your digital copy of today's free gift, simply text the keyword on your screen to 40544 or visit the web address shown on your screen. And be sure to select the digital download option on the request page. It's now easier than ever for you to study God's Word with amazing facts wherever and whenever you want. And most important, to share it with others.